السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي um, I, Whenever I speak I always like to begin with this dua and uh, this dua is actually the dua of Musa عليه السلام and as we know Musa عليه السلام was charged with a really really difficult task and that is that he had to uh, take his people and he actually had to approach the greatest tyrant that walked the earth and that was Pharaoh of course so what he asks God he asks Allah Rabbi shrah li sadri oh my Lord expand my chest Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri and make my matters easy for me وَحْلُلْ عُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي And take the knot out of my tongue so that they can understand my speech, my words. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this and you know there's something within these words which I think is relevant to the topic that I wanted to talk about today which is the topic of hope. And you know when it comes to hope we put our hopes in a lot of things. And in this case Musa alayhi salam he had a really heavy and very difficult job. The question is, you know, how was he going to uh, fulfill his mission? How was he going to carry out this task? It's a very difficult task. He had to face the worst tyrant to walk the earth and a tyrant who um, killed babies as a, a policy. A tyrant who, you know, tortured people. And this is who he had to face. So he's asking God for that help. But when he's taking on this difficult task, where does he put his hope? This is a really important question because we put our hopes in a lot of things. And the, the, the main reason why we end up falling, the reason why we end up becoming broken, the reason why we end up becoming disappointed is because it's like a person who is climbing. Right? You know, if you've ever seen, you know, pictures of, or videos of a mountain climber or someone who's climbing a cliff. And when you're climbing a cliff, there's, there's something very important in that, in that whole equation, and that's what? What's the most important part of, or what's the most important thing for someone who's climbing a cliff? Say it louder. It, the equipment. Specifically what? What part of the equipment? It's basically the rope that's holding that person up, right? Now imagine if that person just got rid of that rope completely and instead said, you know what, I'm okay with the twigs, right? I don't need that rope anymore because along the way I see a lot of twigs. I see a lot of little branches, you know, connected to the cliff. And I'm just going to use that to climb. Well, what, well, you guys don't have to be professional, professional mountain climbers to know what's going to happen. What happens if you do that? Well, what's going to happen to the twig? It's going to snap. Is that the twig's fault? Is it like you can go and like sue the twig, be upset at the twig? Is it the twig's fault? It's not a hard question. It's like, it's like a quiz that y'all can get a hundred on. No, it's not the twig's fault, right? Ooh, whose fault is it? The climber, right? Because a twig, a twig, everyone knows, cannot hold my weight, right? And if I'm going to hold on to a twig with all my weight, then I'm the one who's to blame because it's not the nature of the twig, it's not the creation of the twig, it's not the purpose of the twig to hold me up. Do we agree? And if I do that, and I hold on to a twig with all my weight, what happens to the twig? We said, what happens? It snaps, it breaks. Okay, now what happens to me? Yeah, that was a good illustration. Right? Um, I fall, I crash. And that's because of something called gravity. Can I curse gravity? Can I be upset with gravity that I fell? This is just the nature of the world. This is the nature of the creation. Why am I talking about that? Because this is what we do. This is a metaphor, right? What I just talked about. Because this is what we do in life. This is what we do in life. We go through our lives and we're climbing. I mean, we're, we're going through a journey, as the Sheikh said. We're on a journey 
And in that journey, we have to climb, we have to struggle, we have to strive. And in that journey, we're going to have to hold on to things. So what we do is we hold on to the wrong things. What we do is we put all of our weight, we put all of our hope, for example, in our money. In our money to keep us secure. And so long as I have that money, I feel like I'm secure. And if I lose that money, I feel insecure. We put our hopes in other people. We put our hopes in our efforts. We put our hopes, you know, in our, in our, in our careers, in our degrees. And when we do that, we get to a point where it snaps and we become disappointed. We fall. But the problem is not, again, you know, for example, if I'm going to put all of my hope and all of my dependence in another human being, now when that human being cannot hold my weight, for me to then blame that other human being is like me blaming the twig. Right? Because it's not, it's not the twig's fault. That's not the nature of a twig. You can't expect a twig to be something that it's not. And in this case, for me to expect a human being to be something that only Allah can be, that only God can be, is to expect it to be something that it was never created to be. So when I put my hope, now Allah then says, and in contrast to this whole scenario that I just described, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah that whoever whoever, um, disbelieves in Taghut, فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوَثْقَالَ فِصَامَ لَهَا That when a person dis- truly believes, here's what they've done. They've held on to the trustworthy handhold that never breaks. So in contrast to these twigs, which is, which is what people go through life doing, going from one twig to the next, and our, and our you know, false attachments, the things that we depend on, the things that we hold on to, to, to keep us up, right? To, to, to support us, to hold us, they change. You know, as we, as we go through life, they kind of evolve. And this is a progression which Allah also documents in the Quran. In Surah um, Al Hadith, Allah talks about all these different sort of false senses of security, all these different false attachments that they change as we grow. Allah says, اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. He talks about five stages almost in this ayah. Because it begins, and the, and the ayah begins by talking about play, لعب. You know, he says, know that the life of this world is play. And you know what, um, what, when you first come into this world, what is your world about? Like a child, what does that child care about most? Let me put it this way, if you want to get a present, a gift for a child, and you're like, okay, you know what, I really want to make this child happy, so I'm going to go drop a thousand dollars on an Armani suit in their size. How, how much are they going to care? They won't care at all, in fact. But if you drop a dollar on a rattle, they're going to be really happy. And that's because for a child, the most important thing is play. Right? This is what is this, you know, the focus of a child. But then you know the child grows up, and then now there's something else that's important to the child. You know when you get older, and you're probably like 11, 12... This is where your focus now is entertainment. Entertain me, right? This is, that's why, like, when I ask this question, anyone who works with middle school age children know that their favorite thing to say is, I'm bored. Right? Or, that's boring. And the reason for that is, it's a stage in life where you just want to be constantly stimulated. Keep me entertained. So entertainment becomes the most important thing. That's that twig. That's that thing that you're, that's most important to you. And Allah says, after la'ib, what does he say next in the ayah? Lahu. La'ibun wa lahu. Lahu means entertainment. It's like just, you know, keeping you occupied. It's basically empty and entertainment. Lahu. La'ibun wa lahun or amusement. That's another way to translate this. Play, amusement. But then what about when you get into high school? What's most important when you're in high school? Teenagers. 
Friends, but not just friends, how you appear to those friends. What you're wearing, what brand name you're wearing. And, you know, if you look and you study things like eating disorders, you find that they mostly happen in that age, in the, t- in the teenage age. Because this is a time when appearance is very important. It's extreme, and you know, there's no other time in your life where you take that long to get ready as when you're in high school, right? Before, you have to wake up really early because you have to take forever to get ready for school. And what you wear, you know, I actually knew someone who kept track of what they wore every day so they would never wear the same thing twice in a, in a school year. <laughs> actually kept track. This is a true story. Anyway, um, it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Our parents didn't buy us brand names. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> So the point here is that this is the time when appearance is super important. So Allah next says, wazina. Zina means adornment, you know, like decoration. That's what's most important to you at that point. But then, you know, when you go into college, you could go to class in your pajamas. You don't care. Right? At that point, you've given, you've you've left behind the brand names. You literally, in you get out of bed and you go to class in your sweats. Right? Nobody cares what you're wearing to class, but they care what, you, what score you got on your exam. Right? They care what program you got into, whether or not you got into med school or not. You know, that's what you use to boast. You don't say, oh, you know what kind of pants I'm wearing? You know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what brand I'm wearing? That was in high school. Right? It doesn't matter anymore. Now it's like showing off with uh, your accomplishments. And then Allah says, وَتَفَاخُرُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَفَاخُرُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ is this showing off between one another, boasting. You know, you boast about like your scores, you know, the program you got into, your, you know, your MCATs, whatever. And then you know what? You get settled, you get married and you have children. And now, all those other things don't matter anymore. But now what matters? وَتَكَاثُرُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Now it's about trying to like get more and more and compete and collect in wealth and children. Now is the time when you're like, <laughs> um, well, you know, your cousin spent this much on their wedding. We have to spend this much, right? Like there, there's this competition now in money and in children. Or now it's, it's like what do you use to kind of have a status? It's to talk about what your kids are doing, Right? My kid is a doctor. What's your kid? You know? It's like, that's how now, that's what's important to me. That's what I use to show my status. Now, all of those things put together, Allah says, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ It's like, he he gives us an analogy. You know, the best teachers use analogies. The best teachers use analogies. He says, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ And who's the best teacher? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then his prophets. He says, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ It's like a heavy rain. أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ That makes the farmer pleased because of the vegetation that the heavy rain brings. So that's what these things are like. But then what happens to that vegetation? كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَطَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حطاما. But then that vegetation, you all know what happens to it, right? Like I could get you the most beautiful bouquet of roses. I love roses. Roses are awesome. But roses are only beautiful for like two seconds, right? What happens to a rose after a week, after two weeks? What happens? First it starts to wilt, starts to become dry, it becomes a yellow, and then it becomes just something that becomes like debris. I can take that rose that used to be so perfect, and I can crumble it in my hand, and I can go outside in the wind, and it's gone. It's nothing. Why does Allah use this analogy? Because He's telling us something. He's teaching us something. He's saying that these things, they please you for a moment, right? The, 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 the rattle, the video games, the play, the amusement, the brand name clothes, the scores on your MCATs, you know, the the house, the kids, the wealth, all this stuff, it makes you happy for a while. It's like playing Monopoly, right? How many people play Monopoly? 
Ever heard of Monopoly? <laughs> All right. I didn't mean that you play Monopoly like now, but you played it at some point. Okay. When you're playing it and you're getting rich, right? Because you're getting a lot of Monopoly money and then you're like, or, and then you're like owning stuff and then every time someone visits your stuff, then they have to pay you. So when you're playing Monopoly, you're really happy and pleased for like 15 minutes. Because why? Because you're rich. You have all this cool ownership. You own stuff. You own land. You own property. You own money. But, but can you actually buy anything with that money? If I take all my millions of dollars, I don't even know how much you make in Monopoly. But like you're a millionaire, right? For like... Two seconds, you're a millionaire. Now take that money and try to buy a house with it. What's going to happen? Well, they're going to think you're crazy. But the reason you can't buy a house with Monopoly money is it has no intrinsic value. It has actually no value. Even though it's, it's like you feel rich, like you have something, right? But in reality, capital R, in the real world, it has no value. And that's exactly what all of these things are like. The play and the amusement and the boasting and the brands and the, you know, all the things that you run after, they're just like that monopoly money because although it feels good for a moment, just like the farmer, right, who has this vegetation and it's awesome and it makes him happy, ajab al kuffar, like he's pleased with it. But then eventually the, the reality is that it has no actual value and it passes away. It crumbles, it becomes dry, and then it becomes yellow, and then it's just debris. Allah is teaching us a very important lesson. Now, is that lesson that I can't play with the rattle, that I can't play the video game, that I can't care about adornment, that I, or want to be adorned, that I can't you know, do these things, go to school? No, that's not what Allah is telling us. But he's explaining to us the intrinsic value of these things. That these are things that come and go. That these are fleeting things. Just like that vegetation. That vegetation is there. Oh, okay. That's one way. It's just the water bottle. That vegetation, it makes makes him happy. It makes the farmer happy. But then it passes away. Now, what happens after it passes away? What happens after these things that we chase, these twigs that we hold on to, what happens after they go away? Allah says, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٌ There's one of two outcomes after these other things pass away, and they will pass away. And one thing to keep in mind is this. If you ever get really, really caught up with something in your life, like currently, whether it's your job, or it's your studies, or it's a person in your life, or it's a conflict, or a problem. Just do this mental exercise. Think back 10 years ago. Think back 20 years ago. Think back 25 years ago, 30 years ago, if you, you know, depending on how old you are. And ask yourself, what was, what was, what were you caught up with then? And does it still matter now? Do you understand what I'm saying? Think 30 years ago, maybe you were 5. Maybe you were 2. Maybe you were 25. Think of what was, was keeping you up at night at that point, and ask yourself, is that still a concern today? Chances are, I hope, that whatever you were concerned with when you were 5 is not the same as you are now, yeah? What does that teach you? That teaches you that these things which, yes, at In the moment, it feels like it's everything, right? In the moment, it feels like it's the most important thing. But eventually, it passes away and and it changes. And then now, those things that were so important now don't mean anything to you. What happens at the end, after all this passes away, is one of two outcomes. Either there's, Allah says, the punishment of Allah or His mercy and His forgiveness and His good pleasure. Those are the things that are going to be lasting after these other, other fleeting um, pleasures pass away. What is the, the, the life of this world but channel of deception? 
what is, how do we strike this balance? Because people are going to talk about, well, you know, what is she saying, you know? <laughs> like, I know you're going to say that. Um, what, what, how do we, you know, she's saying that we can't have nice pastries, right? Uh, well, okay. That's not what I'm saying, and that's not what, what, what we're taught. What we are taught is to understand the intrinsic value of these things. It's not haram to play Monopoly, folks. It's not haram. There's nothing wrong with playing Monopoly. But if you think that money is real, that's when you have a problem. That's your problem. And that's really the issue. Yes, okay, have your pastries, and have your degrees, and have your money, and have your pleasure. But if you think that that's what's real, capital R, then that's your problem. When you take those things and you make those things what have the most value, when you take those things and you think those are the things of value, and then you ignore the true things of value, that's when you have a problem. These things are okay to have. That's why Allah says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعَ الْغُرُورِ Okay, it's mata'. It's something you can use and you can have pleasure and you can enjoy, but put it in its proper place. Just like when you're playing Monopoly, enjoy yourself, yeah, have fun. But if you take that money and think it's real, that's the problem. Realize it for what it is. Realize it for what it is. So that go now that takes me back to the idea of hope. Where do I put my hope? Where do I put my dependence? If I'm holding on to a twig, I am going to crash. And this is the reason why we go through our lives, you know, various different crashes, various different um, of, of these like disappointments. It's because I'm holding on to the wrong things. And Allah tells us that when you hold on to Him, this is the trustworthy handhold that never breaks. Because Allah, every single weakness that we have in the creation, what are the weaknesses of the creation? Well, I'll tell you one is that, <laughs> I was just talking to a friend about this. You know, sometimes when you're like having a disagreement with somebody, um, and it's like late at night, and you're really upset, and maybe you really want to like, you really need their help, or maybe you just really need help, and it's like late, and they just fall asleep. I mean, I don't know, maybe some people have that effect on others, but they just fall asleep while, you know, it's like, I, but I really need to talk to you right now. I know it's 3 o'clock in the morning, but, but I mean, I'm human, I need to sleep, you know what I mean? And something just happens. Hello, they're done. What are you going to do then? You know what I'm saying? This sounds funny, but the reason I'm mentioning this example is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically says, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم It's like, He specifically mentions that no slumber overtakes him nor sleep. I feel like this is for married couples, you know? Like just, like, <laughs> it's like a woman's voice puts a man to sleep. What can I say? <laughs> My point is that here Allah is actually specifically saying, yeah, how many married people know exactly what I'm talking about? Allah specifically mentions that he doesn't get tired and he doesn't go to sleep. This is why, because this is just one aspect of the creation that lets us down. Because you know what? It's, you're, it's like I'm a human being, I need sleep. I cannot stay, oh, even though you might need me right now at 3.30 in the morning, but I am human. And this is the nature of, of the creation. We are by nature weak. We can't be what Allah can be. Whereas at 3.30 in the morning, guess who's not sleeping? Right? Who is it that we can turn to that isn't sleeping and never sleeps? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where it comes, so again, this is about where do I put my full dependence, where do I put my full hope? The other aspect I want to talk about in terms of hope is I think one of the biggest mistakes we make in our discussion about religion, our discussion about being religious, is that teaching a concept of perfection, teaching this concept of, um, you know, like, like religious people have to be perfect people. Right? They can't make mistakes, they can't be human, they have to be perfect. And when you hold this, this standard of what it means to be a good human being, what it means to be a good Muslim, if that equals perfect, that's very dangerous. It's extremely dangerous and I'll tell you why. This will later on be used as a tool by Shaitan himself. 
Because if I think that I'm supposed to be perfect, right? So that's my understanding, that's my premise. If I think I'm supposed to be perfect, what happens when I'm not? What, what's going to happen when I'm not? Because guess what? I'm not. <laughs> and I will never be perfect. I wasn't designed to be perfect. So then what happens when I realize that I'm not perfect? What happens when I slip? If I thought I was supposed to be perfect and I'm not, tell me, what's going to happen to me? You lose confidence. You lose confidence. You lose hope. You give up. This is where despair comes in. This is where despair is going to come in. Because here I am, I'm supposed to be this thing, and I'm not. That makes me a failure. Right? Simple enough? If I'm supposed to be something, and I'm absolutely not it, that means I'm a failure, and therefore I now despair, and I give up. I give up. That's something Shaitan uses all the time. See, Shaitan will come through different doors depending on, our, on where we are. You know shaitan doesn't got anything else to do? Right? You guys understand that, right? He's got only one job. Can you imagine if you only had one job? Like literally 24-7? If you want to understand ikhlas, study, study shaitan. Alright? Ikhlas. Ikhlas is like complete, like... Removal of any other purpose, any other intention except that one to take us to hell. <laughs> like, that's all he's got to do. That's all he has to do. And he's got a lot of practice. You know, a lot of job training. So he's good at what he does, but he's not that good. But he does know what he's doing. Now, I'm telling you he knows what he's doing, but I'm also going to tell you that that he is also extremely weak. And even his plots and his plans are also extremely weak. But I'll tell you this, one, you see, shaitan, he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he was being removed from Jannah, and he was upset, like, it's interesting to know actually his response. Because when you look at what did shaitan do when he made a mistake, and what did Adam do when he made a mistake? You do know that when Allah gives us, Allah gives us the story of both of them, and they're kind of put like within the same context, the story, right? Adam was told not to eat from the tree, right? And, and what happened? What did he end up doing? Eating from the tree, right? Iblis was told to do what? to bow to Adam. And what did he do? He refused. Okay? So here you have Iblis who's being told to do something and he refuses. And you have Adam who's being told not to do something and he does it. We good? Let's look at what they did after. Let's look at what they did after. That's where they completely part paths. Because Iblis' response after he makes a mistake is what? It's arrogance and it's despair, actually. Because he says, in, first of all, what he does is he blames Allah for his mistake. Does this sound familiar? Do we ever do this? Like, <laughs> blame other people for our mistakes? This is actually dates back to Iblis. This idea of nothing's my fault... Right? And it's always someone else's fault. This is Iblis. Because Iblis, he made the mistake, but he says, because you have kicked me out. Like blaming Allah. You know? Because you have kicked me out, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to attack them. I'm going to attack your slaves, your servants, from their front and from their back. From their right and from their left. You know what he's vowing? You know what he's doing right there? He is promising to try to come in from any door he can to get us. All right? So he blames Allah. He doesn't humble himself. And what else does he not do? So, okay, let's go back to his mistake. What's his mistake? He didn't make sajda. Yeah? So he's basically refusing to make one sajda. Can you imagine 
If we all went to hell for missing one sajda, do you guys understand what that means? Like fajr itself is how many sajdas? Four. Two each raka, right? So that would mean that if someone missed even one fajr, they couldn't go to Jannah. Do you understand the issue here? It isn't just that he missed the, you know, he refused to, to make sajda. Every single one of us has missed probably more than one sajda in our lifetime. And maybe even refused to make that. When someone's not Muslim, aren't they refusing just like he did? Aren't they actively refusing to make sajda? So wait, then what? What is it that, that he did wrong? He didn't repent. Because you know what? If every one of us were banned from Jannah for missing one sajda, who would be in Jannah exactly? Right? F- fair enough? There is something called tawbah. There's something called istighfar. There's something called repentance. And that is what's saving us. It's not the fact that we're perfect. It's not the fact that we're never going to slip up. It's the fact that we have something from the mercy of Allah called repentance. And Iblis didn't use it. Iblis didn't humble himself. And he didn't, and he didn't have hope enough in Allah. He, didn't have, he, he despaired, essentially. And instead, he became a rebel against Allah. He rebelled instead of humbling himself and repenting. Now contrast that with Adam alayhi salam. What did Adam do after he ate from the tree? Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. Look at his response as compared to because you've done this to me, you know, you bl- blaming Allah. Adam on the other hand alayhi salam, he says, our Lord, and, and, and notice this, this is, this is very important. Our Lord, we have wronged our own selves. You notice he's not blaming anyone else? Rabbana zalamna anfusana. Like how easy would it be for him to blame shaitan at least? Right? I mean shaitan is the one who deceived him. But he didn't even bring up shaitan. He's taking full responsibility. Because he knows that at the end of the day he had free choice. Right? Even though shaitan deceived him, but he's taking full responsibility and saying, Rabbana zalamna anfusana. I'm not going to blame anyone else. I'm going to take full responsibility. We did this to ourselves. We wronged ourselves. And if you don't forgive us and have mercy on us, we will indeed be among the losers. You see, when you have that kind of response after you slip, what happened to Adam? He became a prophet. You understand? He, after slipping, he became a prophet. Do you understand how powerful that is? I mean, talk about redemption, right? He was not only was he forgiven, he was given such an honor and such an honorable position. This was after the slip, guys. After. And that's the power of tawbah. I mean, that's the power of istighfar. That's the power of repenting and humbling yourself. Is that Allah can honor you and raise you up even higher than before you committed the sin. Right? But look at the difference between Iblis and Adam. Iblis didn't have hope in that repentance. Iblis was arrogant. Iblis didn't repent. Adam had hope in Allah. Adam repented. Adam humbled himself. And Adam took full responsibility. That is hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Iblis doesn't want us to have that. Iblis, what he wants is for us the moment we slip to do what he did. Right? Right? The moment we slip, which we will, like I said, we're human, not perfect. But when we slip, he wants us to do what he did, which was despair in the mercy of Allah. And to just give up. So that is why when we mess up, he comes to us from the door of despair. And he says, look at you. 
you do X, Y, Z, and then you're going to go pray? You're such a hypocrite. Look at you. You do X, Y, Z, and you're going to keep that hijab on? You're such a hypocrite. Go take it off. Who are you to walk around with hijab when you do these things? Just take it off. What is he really saying to you? He's saying give up. He's saying despair. He's saying you're not even worth this struggle. Just give up. You're worthless. And when he says to you, you know, yeah, but you're, you're just not good enough to put on the hijab. You know this idea that like hijab is only for angels? You know what I mean? It's like this weird concept that first you have to transform into an angel and grow wings and then put on the hijab. And so there's this idea, because there's that idea, we hold hijabis to like a superhuman standard compared to others. Like, she did that and she's a hijabi. <laughs> like, uh, I didn't know that I became an angel once I put on the hijab. I'm still human. But you know, there's this weird idea that hijab is something for angels. Hijab is like, it's like the crown you put on once you become perfect. And, it, and, and, and once you have that on, you better stay perfect. Right? That's just... Listen, hijab is like salah, is like, it's like saum, it's like fasting, it's like, it's like zakah. It's one of many other acts of worship. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect because I'm doing it. And no one is going to tell you, hey, um, you know the other weird thing we have about hijab? Is this. There's this weird concept that it's better to never wear hijab than to wear it and take it off. Where did that come from? It's like this made-up concept. When in fact the reason we feel that way is because of what people will say. That's the reason. So what people do is, and this is also, Shaitan, like I said, every door he can find, he'll go, right? So he'll deceive you in these really strange kinds of ways. And one of them is, no, 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 don't put on the hijab because you might take it off. Well, that's really weird. So basically, logically, you're telling me it's better to never wear it than to wear it and possibly take it off. So in other words, it's better to disobey Allah for a hundred years than to obey Him for 50 and disobey Him for 50. Does that make any logical sense? But He makes us believe it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So He's basically saying, you're going to fail, so don't even try. That's what He's saying. He's gonna, he, he, he wants us to believe that since we're not perfect, or since we can't be perfect, we might as well not even try. And Allah tells us the opposite. Allah rewards for effort. You know A for effort? Allah rewards us for effort. He's not asking us to be perfect. He's asking us to keep trying. He's saying, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي أَلَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ He's addressing who in this ayah? This is an ayah in Surah Al-Zumar. Who is he addressing? He's not addressing the disbeliever. He's not addressing the hypocrite. He is addressing the believer. He's addressing the slave. He says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي Oh, my slave. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. But what comes after that seems to be a contradiction. Because he says, Oh, say, oh, my slave who have, what? Wrong their own selves. In other words, he is addressing the sinning slave. Right? Yes or no? Which means, wait a minute, you mean even slaves of Allah sin? Right? We had this idea in our head that, no, no, slaves of Allah mean they never sin. Right? They're sinless. But no, Allah is addressing his slave and saying, who have wronged their own self. They have sinned. And what does he say to those people? لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. This is the opposite message of shaitan. Anytime you start to feel like you should give up, you know that's shaitan. Allah will never ever tell you to give up. Allah will never push you to give up. Allah will never close the door. The door of Allah is always open until when? until the day you die, until the moment that you die. And that's when, that's when you no longer can repent. 
But until then, until then, anytime you hear this voice in your head, literally a voice in your head, that tells you to give up, that tells you you're not good enough, that tells you you should stop trying, that you're a hypocrite, that you're this, that's shaitan. That's shaitan trying to make you do what he did, which was give up, give up, and not continue to have that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah wants from you is not perfection, but He wants you to keep trying. And when you slip, to get back up. To get back up and to go and to keep going. And to repent. Allah tells us that if we were not to sin and then repent, He would remove us from the earth and bring a people that would sin and repent. This is something Allah, not only does He forgive, get this, get this, he loves to forgive. So it's actually a pleasure, it actually makes Allah pleased when we repent. It's not like, you know when you wrong someone and they come and apologize and you begrudgingly forgive? You know, like, fine. You know your sibling? They like punched you and then they came and said sorry and you're like, you know, you're like, you're like upset. Like, you don't, you're kind of begrudgingly forgiving. This is not Allah. Allah is high above any analogy. Allah actually loves that process. It pleases him. And there's a hadith that talks about this. The example that's given is a man in the middle of the desert who has his entire livelihood on this camel. All right? And all of a sudden the camel goes away. Like, just runs away. You know what this means for the man, right? Certain death, Okay? I mean, your food, your water, everything's gone. So he's going to die now. This is serious. But then he finds that same camel just coming back on its own. And the hadith says the joy that that man feels, that's the analogy of the joy that Allah feels when one of his slaves repents, comes back. It's not just acceptance of that repentance, but it is actual ple- joy. It actually pleases Allah. He becomes pleased. He loves to forgive. Doesn't just forgive, but he loves to forgive. So this is something we have to reject. This idea of, I'm not good enough. I'm too far away from Allah to come back. I'm not like those people in the masjid who are, you know, perfect. I'm not part of that club, you know. And you know, sometimes people make us feel this way too. And may Allah, you know, protect. But you have to keep focused and realize, realize that this is Islam, that this path is not a path for perfect people. It's not a path for perfect people because there's no such thing. Perfect people don't exist. But, but, it is a path for those who are striving to purify themselves. Striving to keep going, even when they mess up. Striving to not lose hope. There's one of my favorite quotes of Ibn al-Qayyim. And he says that shaitan rejoiced when Adam was kicked out of Jannah. I mean, sorry, when Adam, sorry, not kicked out, but when Adam was taken out of Jannah and came to the earth. Shaitan rejoiced when Adam was taken out of paradise and taken down to the earth. But what he didn't realize was that the diver sinks to the bottom of the ocean, gathers pearls, and then rises again. And this is exactly, subhanAllah, that path where we, yes, sometimes we slip, sometimes we get really low. But it is when you're really low that you have a choice. You can either stay there, you can stay there and you can drown, or you can actually gather pearls from that bottom and come back up actually better than you were before you fell down to the ground. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته